Well, we'd like to welcome you to my presentation today. Being introduced by a computer is a is a novelty. Calling this this one particular is delving into colonial town records. I thought it'd be important to define the word delve. Delve means to search or to dig into something. So, and there's a phrase in English that's dig, dig and delve, which are both the same thing. So it's dig and dig, but that's just the way a lot of those sayings are. Okay, so here's the here's the the core of this. The core of this is the town records, meaning records kept by individual settlements from the size of of very small villages to multi-million population uh, metropolises. These town records have been around forever. Some of the oldest records that we have in existence would qualify as town records. And so uh, one of the things uh, that we understand that happens when we're working with genealogy is that not all the records we can use and are not all the records that are valuable to be used are actually cataloged or designated as uh, genealogy records. And that's certainly the case with town records. Uh, some of the town records have been collected, as I'll talk about in just a few minutes, by some of the larger genealogical research, online research and family tree programs like Family Search and Ancestry and My Heritage and Find My Past, et cetera. Uh, but there really hasn't been as far as anything is concerned online yet, any kind of systematic gathering of town records into any great huge repository. And so how many towns do you think there are in your country, in the United States or in Canada or Mexico or someplace? Thousands, tens of thousands perhaps, around the world, millions of places where people live. And Finding those records is the process that I'll talk about, but it also is an important thing to understand that this is this is what we call basic genealogical research. The difference between this and what most people are doing today on and calling it genealogical research is you're looking at a set of records that have been accumulated by a major genealogical website, like the ones I just mentioned, um, Ancestry, Family Search, et cetera. And so what is that? Is that research? Yeah, well, to the extent that you're looking at original records and and you're making an effort to get online and putting that together and trying to find the interest, the information you have. But that kind of ends the game for a lot of people. And the game goes on on offline and with records that are not available any place online they're still sitting in paper in various plates around the places around the world and or microfilm and they're not gathered into anybody's big on online collection uh, fortunately for us uh, many of those local areas have started to digitize their rec their records and there's thousands tens of thousands probably into the I, I would guess in excess of a million or more websites online that have collections of digital records, and some of which we would consider, as genealogists, would consider to be extremely valuable. So that's kind of the issue that's going on here. The kinds of records that you're you're likely to be looking for for your ancestors are not the ones that go back before around 1500, because they're probably not uh, mostly impenetrable by people who haven't learned specific languages or uh, learned to read um, Latin or something like that, Chinese. So the issue here is when does they actually begin? Well, city clerks began in England, and this is just an example. And you can look for other countries and find the same kinds of information. So one of the things about for doing this kind of a presentation online is I like to emphasize that I give examples of the type of place where you can find records that are going to be valuable uh, genealogically. But I can also say that even my all my examples are just 
at what that is is an example of where some records might be available. So this is 12, 1272 AD was from the Corporation of Old London. You can go to any now very large city in the world and find records that go back many hundreds of years from the origin of some of the, the largest cities. So these are not records that are even particularly made available to the public in, in many instances and could require a prof professional level genealogical entry into uh, different kinds of record repositories like university special collections libraries or archive national or, or local archives, those kinds of things. But as a genealogical research, you should assume in the colonies of uh, American colonies that made up the United States of America, you, you can assume that every single city and town in the colonies began keeping records when it was established. Now, are they still available? That's the thing that is the, is the kind of doorway to finding and using these kinds of records. So the, the issue is, yeah, well, do we know? And who would know? Sometimes the cities know. Sometimes the cities don't know that they even have records or that they're being kept. And they may be in a local museum, a local archive, a local historical society, a genealogical society, into the state art library or state record keep any place where records are kept, it's uh, there's a possibility uh, that there are some records that come from any place in the surrounding area, and even then it could be from all the way across the country. Finding genealogical records and discovering the records, where the records are kept, and then deciphering those records is the main activity of doing genealogical research. So always check to see when or when a village or town or city was established. And you can do that by going and look, looking in Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia, you might have various opinions about Wikipedia, but one of the things that it does very, very well is that there are almost, I, I have rarely found a place across the world that somebody has said, my family was from and given me that information. This is from tiny villages in, the, in Italy or Spain or Central or South America or spread all the way around in, in Africa or wherever that I've been helping people do research. I find everything. I found almost every single place even neighborhoods sometimes in Wikipedia. So this is one area that Wikipedia kind of has a kind of has lock on. And so if I looked up Barnstable, for example, uh, the Barnstable County Courthouse and Barnstable uh, in Massachusetts, then um, that particular record would be uh, telling me exactly. It tells me it's a state. It tells me it's a county tells me when it was first settled, tells me when it was incorporated, and it tells me when the city was incorporated, and the town and the city, and then where it was named. So you can assume there's also a Barnstable in, in England. So if you do this routinely, now this is, this is the, the methodology. The methodology is that you come across the name of a town. Let's say the town is, I'm going to give you one in Arizona, uh, Nutrioso, Arizona. And that doesn't ring any bells with probably uh, almost 100% of the people in the United States, even those who live in Arizona. And so you would say, well, I don't know anything about that town, and I'd better know something about where it is and what jurisdictions it's in. So then you would look it up in Wikipedia, and you would find out that it was in Apache County, and that uh, it had a population of about 350 people, and that it was probably established in the 1800s, and that's been around for a long, long time. So those are the kinds of things that you're, you're, you need to know, basically, before you start doing anything in research with genealogy. You have to know the location. 
to know the location of events that occurred in your ancestors' lives. And once you have once you have a, a name for that location, then you need to have do the research and find out the basic facts, when it was settled, when it was incorporated, uh, if that all of that applies. And once you have that piece of information, then you can begin to accurately just try to find out if there are records for that location, because otherwise you have no beginning point. You can't really, you can't just guess where those records might be. Uh, this is particularly true if you're dealing in a place where you're not really familiar. I, mean, I have no problem, for example, in, in Utah and Arizona, because I know all the counties and I know most of the towns in both states. So I can tell pretty quickly where something is located and where the records might be. But when you jump into another state that I'm not as familiar with, then it, I need to go through this process each time that I'm doing research. And that's the basis, because you need to know the city, town, or village. The jurisdiction is the, the overall term that we're working with here, where your ancestor lived, because records are created. And this is the, the standard definition. Genealogically valuable records were created at or near the time of an event that occurred in your ancestors' lives by someone who either witnessed the event or was required to report the event, had it some duty to report the event. In addition, you can find where those records are located by anyone who had the duty to maintain, record, or archive those records. And even if that isn't the case, there's another upper step with that, or anybody who may have had an interest in acquiring the record. So that is kind of the, the framework that we work in when we're talking about doing genealogy. So where are these major collections? Let's start with some of the largest collections. Um, this is uh, a copy of a, uh, a book from Barnstable uh, Town Records, and it uh, was published back in uh, 1910. One of the things that you're going to find in these uh, these town records are actual genealogical information, births, deaths, marriages, land, property, probates, anything, any kind of other record sources. You may very well find people in this particular town who um, have collected something about those records. Uh, one of the other important factors that you need to understand is the older these collections are, the more valuable they are to you as a genealogist, because that's when the people were alive. So if I'm looking at this record from Barnstable and my family came from there, which probably some of them did, this is in 1910. And so the person who wrote this book or collect, the, the, the organization that, that printed it or, or collected it, would have had access to people who were living in 1910, which means they could have been born clear back in the early 1800s and perhaps even into the 1700s. So uh, we, we've got to use that kind of mentality where when we're looking at records, that what we find is uh, the records that are contemporaneous and that have some uh, possibility of, of bringing up information that's not there. Now, these biggest collections, obviously, are family search. And I find more town records on family search than I do on other websites. Ancestry has some. Archive.org has a huge collection of them, mostly in books. And uh, if you're not a familiar with archive.org, archive.org right now, based on the number of books and manuscripts and records that they have, uh, we say printed, handwritten, including everything they have on there, is, is undoubtedly the largest online collection that's accessible in the world. And so if you're not familiar with archive.org and have not used it, then I would recommend you start looking at it and exploring it as, as quickly as possible because you're you're simply ignoring a, a vast library, the largest collection there it exists that I'm aware of. And books.google.com 
Google and the kind of in the background now, but originally they were trying to digitize every book that ever been published. I think they're being passed up by archive.org, but you never know because Google doesn't tell you archive.org is a nonprofit, not a profit for for profit company. And so uh, they tell you how many books and publications they have every day. Uh, they update it constantly, but uh, Google doesn't tell you. Library of Congress uh, has a whole section, and most of their genealogical used to be called the G and, and local histories section of the Library of Congress. But now there is no longer a reading room for genealogical research at the Library of Congress. And it's just in the general stack. So you you have a little bit more of a challenge, even if you actually go there. But the one point about the Library of Congress is a very low percentage of their actual their collections are digitized and made available to the public, except through other organizations like Family Search and Ancestry and Archive.org and et cetera. American Ancestry, particularly for the for the records on the East coast of the United States and the in the original colonies and particularly in the New England colonies it's the American ancestors is uh, is the website uh, published by the New England Historic Genealogical Society one of the the oldest genealogical society in the United States and there's many many more these are just very large collections and and I would uh, I don't want to discourage anyone from going and using these collections because these are valuable. They have got valuable collections. It's just that they only, they are only very limited in the in what would be generally available nationwide, even here in the United States. So it's important to understand. Now this is Family Search, and I did a search for town records. I could have said city records, and I could have gotten a different set. In other words, I've made one search, and the total that came out was 21,481. That's not close to being the number for the whole United States. So you can say that that's, uh, there's a lot of those are, are kind of uh, sequential sets of records and things like that. But you can see here that this is a significant number of uh, records that, that are available. And uh, when people come to me and say, well, I've searched everywhere. And then I say, well, where were your people from? And they say, and I said, well, of course, you've read their town records since their beginning. And they say no. And that's, and you know, that just carries on that conversation. And I have to acknowledge that you can very easily become overwhelmed by the number of records available. And if you see this image here, you can probably guess that I had it uh, generated by artificial intelligence because I probably didn't find a pile of books being hit by a large way. So what are the challenges? Why aren't these something that comes up on every discussion about finding ancestors throughout the United States and the rest of the world? Well, there's quite a few reasons for that. The, the very first reason is how many have been digitized as opposed to how many are still sitting and wherever they were originally kept or being maintained. And that uh, that's the big issue. That's the issue that uh, you, you really need to do some intensive research online about whether the, uh, these particular records could exist. And you make always make the assumption that I mentioned previously that those records, that they do exist. In other words, if you find a town that you're talking about in Iowa or, or Texas or Louisiana or someplace, and you do a real quick search for whatever records from that area occur, and you say town records for, or city records for, or records for, and you don't come up with anything, that does not mean those records don't exist. That just means that whatever you've searched for has isn't isn't being found by the search engine you're using, but it also mean could mean that they're sitting in somebody's library, in a in a university special collections library on a shelf, or they're sitting someplace else in a in a local library or someplace out there. 
And then the question is, are there any transcribed ones? Uh, you know, up to this point in time, in the last couple of years, handwriting recognition has gotten to the point where it's it's not only available, it is in many cases more accurate than almost all the cases that we've that I've observed is more accurate than individuals with people transcribing or doing an index from the records. So the question still now is that these originals are probably all in some kind of handwritten record, and it's going to take a considerable time, even with computers and even with them being digitized and and, and centrally transcribed by handwriting recognition. The type of information that needs to be extracted from these records is not as uh, organized, let's call it, not as easily extracted as it is from other records. Most of the town records are sort of the minutes of whoever was running the town, the town uh, made by the town clerk. So they're records that are more um, in the nature of a dialogue of, than they are of just lists of names and dates and places or deeds or probates or things like that. They're just a long narrative of what was happening in the town, which, by the way, is extremely important. And if you were going through uh, looking at records like this, like these records here, you would find out that they were extremely valuable and talked about marriages and deaths and land sales and all sorts of things. Availability is always an issue. There's no question about it that, that trying to find these records can be very difficult, especially if you don't have any real concrete knowledge, let's say, that the records exist, but you have a suspicion that they should have been been made and or that they should be available, but that may not mean that they actually are available. Then the condition is always an issue uh, as to how well they were preserved. And uh, even if they are available, are they can you actually get any information because they may not be in a condition that is readable? And then the question always people ask is whether there's an index, and the answer is almost never because they weren't used. The use of the records was not for genealogical purposes or to extract information from people and record that. It was used to carry on the business of the town or the city or the wherever. So here's some selected examples, and, and these are selected examples, and I'll reemphasize that. You can, you can extract, you, when I give you an example, that means that there are probably a class of records based on that example, that, that when you look at the, at the particular record that I highlight, that means that there's not in just in that city or that town or that village, but that it may be available in every other city, town, and village in the in the world. That there, there's probably some other one, some other records that were kept. And so it's important to understand some dates. And so where these uh, where it's possible that these records came from and where they might be stored. And one of the basic issues here is if you're talking about the United States colonial history you're talking about a history that spreads out for hundreds of years and where the records are kept are going to be determined to a large extent by who would have collected those records and where they were. So this is, uh, for example, and I just used St. Augustine as an example founded in 1565 to give you kind of a benchmark. Uh, St. Augustine often comes up as being the oldest city in the in what's now the United States and it was founded in uh, 1565 but uh, that's not really true that's just because that's the way people look at it and so it was an, and it's even it's that's even in Spanish that's a Spanish colony so you can start with the family search research wiki this is a very good place to always start to get an idea of what records might be available and and this is colonial records going back into the original records that were started in um, in what's now the United States. So we're going to back, back on colonial. And 
what happens is that when you say colonial records, then automatically people think, oh, the 13 colonies, da, 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 da. Well, yeah, that's great, but that's not the history of the United States. That's not the complete history, and it's not even a very balanced history. So now what we need to do is look at where they really originated, where the records are probably located, and depending on your own family and its your family's history, you may have records that go back into this time. So we start out with the Spanish colonies because they were the first ones that settled this part of the world in the United where the United States now exists. And these are the states. This is all these are all from the research wiki in familysearch.org under the search tab, the research wiki. And this, these are the states with Spanish colonization. So they're not all in the western part of the United States. There's Georgia and Louisiana and uh, Florida. And so these are the ones that, that, if you're going back in time, the records that you're going to find that come from these communities are probably primarily church records. But there may be also other records that were being used that had to do with the business of the town. And some of these can be very interesting. The Spanish colonial records, here's the St. Augustine Historical Society. And I've given the address, uh, URL address, on each of the slides. So what you're seeing here are uh, the URL addresses. And the Spanish colonial records for St. Augustine first settled in 1565. So if you're fortunate enough to have family that has lived in uh, St. Augustine or lived in St. Augustine, you have records that, that probably go back to the time when they were, when your family was among the first or the first time they, they went there. It's claimed to be the oldest in, in the United States, but it's not. The oldest continually settled town in America is Orabi, and that's a Hopi Pueblo in Arizona, and it was founded in about 1100 AD. So if your your family goes back to the Native Americans in the western part of the United States and in the eastern part of the United States, it's very possible if there are any records and and don't assume automatically because they were Native Americans that there were no records, because there certainly are Hopi traditions that go way back in time. So these aren't dead ends. They're just simply difficult to create a new um, aspect of difficulty. British colonization started in the 1600s, in 1607, and that's in Jamestown. And... We call that the end of that in 1776 because that's when the Declaration of Independence was signed. And we usually date the United States from 1776. But uh, here's uh, earliest church records, earliest land records, and earliest court records. From, from uh, This is still all from the research wiki. And I've got it down there at the bottom, the link. And these are all the states. Uh, listed that have the earliest records for British colonies, and then other states that were colonized by Britain, including some that overlap the Spanish records, and uh, states that are outside of the original colonies. So these records do actually go back, and here is the town records of the town of Plymouth. This is a published book. Uh, this is available on archive.org, and it is volume one of the uh, that were published by the town, and it's from 1636 to 1705. Here's, here's a little bit of a challenge if you want to see what I'm talking about. is uh, Let's assume that you have record of ancestors who go back to Plymouth in that time frame in the 1600s. Go to your family on the family search family tree or on Ancestry or wherever. And if you have these people that uh, are in New England going back to this time frame, just see in the sources listed how many of them are listing sourced uh, town records as a source. That's, that's the challenge that if you do that, 
I know what's going to happen because I look at the records when I go through and help people with their genealogy research and and uh, finding records outside of the birth, marriage, and death and census and other records is, is uh, pretty unusual. So here's the first page of the Plymouth records. And it's a little bit hard to understand. And these particular first page records, if you really want to know, this is a earmark. Now, if you don't know what about earmarks, then you're missing another big set of records. Earmarks were uh, like cattle brands. Instead of using hot iron to burn a, a design into the side of a cow, they cut slices out of their ears, which neither one of them sound very humane, but uh, were a way to keep track of their animals. Most cows look pretty much the same, actually. But these are earmarks. They go way back into history. And earmarks and, and uh, cattle brands are a really interesting and very helpful because these brands and marks were, were inherited. And uh, if you live out west, at, in the western part of the United States, and you and you're acquainted with it, or your family came from a ranch or farm that had animals and, and they were branded, then you know that you know that your brand has probably been in your family for generations. And so that's uh, that's a, what one way of tracking people. And another thing is that the uh, women were the ones who sometimes either maintained the brand or inherited the brand. And sometimes that is a way of finding out their maiden names. And so this is the cattle earmarks. And this is another book from uh, archive.org. So then we have an early record. This is a, a town record, and I got one that was a little bit larger in Albany, which of course is the capital of, of uh, New York. But basically, we're looking here, and uh, we'll see that there is uh, some non-English language there in Dutch. And that goes into the original. And this is a, a translation of the original Dutch. So here's the really the Dutch records of Albany, New York. And uh, so there it is, seven volumes of this book. And this one is on family search. Now, what about Jamestown, which was the uh, which is as kind of acknowledged as the first English uh, settlement. And uh, they began that process. And then we have here the first settlers of Jamestown, Virginia manuscript on family search. So this is the, the first settlers of, of the town, and they have been exhaustively researched, and their descendants have been researched. And you're, you're unlikely to find anything that... Uh, hasn't already been recorded in family search and probably changed 50 or 100 or a thousand times but there's really not a lot of there is really no controversy over who these people were and who their descendants were what about savannah georgia there is another old town and uh, if you're looking here on family search you'll find georgia colonial records and then you'll find specific records about uh, Savannah and the settlement of Savannah and who uh, came to Georgia in that first group of settlers. And then the French colonization, we're moving out of the English or British colonization, which began from the 17th century to 1803. So uh, it's not as well documented, but the states that co were colonized by France are all listed here, and they're mostly in the Middle West and uh, in that area and uh, into Florida and other places. So you may not have understood that French colonies, but if you know a little bit about the history of the United States, you'll know that, that the, the Louisiana Purchase gave the United States the bulk of the land. And here is the French Colonial Historical Society 
and it has links to research databases and web pages and other material for uh, looking into all of the French colonies, not just in New America or New France, but in Asia and Africa in general. So there are ways to get into the records for each of these areas. Now, in some instances, as I mentioned, uh, particularly with early Spanish language records, the records that you're likely to find are more of the church records where there were churches established, uh, particularly from the Catholic Church. And those records are uh, extremely valuable, but uh, digging will give you a greater understanding of, of how many other records there are. Dutch colonization from 1614 to 1664 uh, gives you the earliest church records, earliest land records, and earliest court records. A lot of these are in Dutch, and as I mentioned just a moment ago, that uh, some have been translated into English and published. But understanding that these places share the uh, colonies, uh, the origins with Great Britain, and also with the other countries who uh, made claims to the United States. So here are some, some uh, particularly interesting records. Now, one of the things that you're noticing that you should notice from this record that I, or these records that I've been showing you about the, um, the research wiki is these are on a state level, but you can assume that towns that were founded in this early time period would have also been made and that there should be records from the towns that were created in the villages and the cities that were created as a result of each of these countries, England, France, Spain, uh, Netherlands, were the ones who made these settlements. And this is from New York State Archives. And this is digital collections of the Dutch records. And there are 7,000 objects in this collection in the early Dutch records. And it looks like some of them are probate records and other kinds of records. You may not be aware that Sweden colonized uh, Delaware, and so that the records, some of the earliest records in Delaware are going to end up being in Swedish and from the Swedish towns that were established, albeit their, their claims in New Sweden colony were not uh, extensively or extensive or long, uh, there's still records here that go back into that area. And we have the Russian colonization, which uh, were colonized in Alaska and California, Hawaii. Interestingly enough, I have researched these records, and they were up in the Aleutian Islands. And the questions came up about uh, some one of the islands in the Aleutian chain and whether or not the records existed. And we found that the records were in a huge pile in the National Archives uh, in Washington, not necessarily in the Washington Archive itself, but they were in the collection of the National Archives at one of the branch archives. James? That didn't help. Yes. There was one question in the chat that I thought you might want to answer. It says the slide with the British colonization, the information on that slide, the URL was cut off at the bottom. Is it possible to get that? Want to address oh, that? Oh, that's that. Yeah, just go to go to family search. I couldn't get the whole thing on every page sometimes. So when you go to family search and look on the research wiki on that particular section, then you'll see everything. Like I said, these are examples. Most of these pages go long and pages, they're like pages and pages of this information in each one of these. And they're just type records. In other words, just because this is one record from the National Archives of Russian American Company records, which is the ones that I looked at or knew about, that doesn't mean that's the only place you're going to find them or only records there are. This is just one example of records from Russian colonization and with the other subjects.
oh, it's possible to get the URL. I'm sorry. Yes, all you need to do to go to the British colonization is to the colonies records. It's the same uh, previous URL. I'm sorry, that was cut off. Land records. Now, when you're talking about town records and city records, and I guess we use the term town and more exhaustive than just city or any of having to list all the different types of, of uh, settlements there are. But the land records are very important overall in doing research. And they exist from the very first settlements. And even if the town itself did not, or the records have not been preserved, the land records, the sales records, the patent records, the various records about, the, about land, it's land transactions, uh, if any records are ever going to be preserved, it's through land records. And so those are extremely important. We always hear the stories about burnt counties where the, the courthouse burned down and yada, yada, yada. And so I can't do my research in that county. And the answer is, well, that means you are not doing very much research because if the land records, for example, got burnt down, they're, they're burned down, they were not... There was they absolutely had to be reconstituted because they had to go back and and determine who owned that each piece of property in that town because there otherwise there was no there would be clouds on the title to everybody in that county and nobody could sell any property because nobody could be assured that that person did not have some sort of of claim or lien against their property so land records the question I would always ask people when they said their land records were burned and they didn't know there weren't any records, I said, oh, well, I guess your people never had to pay taxes, real estate taxes in that county. No. They immediately realized that, uh, yes, uh, people did have to pay real estate taxes and that they're uh, definitely going to know who owned or who owed the taxes. So talking about that, the deeds in, in various and historical deeds, um, and this is an example, the oldest deed in the U.S. can be found in New Hampshire back in 17, 1679, and their deed book's been digitized back to 1640. So um, these are necessarily all on family search or on ancestry. These are records that you need to be aware of exist in counties all the way across the United States, every county. Whether or not their records have been digitized is an issue, but many of them have, and many of them have the complete chain of title of each of all the property online. Now, from the original colonies and from all of the original European countries who had an interest, or even in Russia, there were documents that were created by the sovereign in that country, giving land to individuals or to companies. And these are, for example, this is an example, the land patents that were given to Lord Baltimore to create what is now the state of Maryland. And those records all exist. And getting into land records is one of the major, absolutely essential ways of tracking families back into the early colonial uh, time period. And there's uh, just, this is a, an example of uh, the type of, of website or collection of, of uh, or library collections of people who have made collections. And this is the American Philosophical Society and they have early American history collections. And it's an early and important repository for material in the late and early Republic periods. And they continue to acquire materials related to the 17th and 19th centuries. These are the kinds of websites and the kinds of institutions that you would be, it would help you to become familiar with if you are doing research back in time in any, any of the parts of the country. So here's another example, and this is primary source collections online, and it was made by the Sam Houston State University in Texas. And uh, these are some of the old 
collections of records for the Spanish settlement of America, as well as other parts of the country. And you'll see that there's a list here from this website. Now you can find these histories in libraries, museums, historical societies, archives, uh, genealogical societies, and university special collections libraries, and online. One of the things that I find that is, for my research in the past and over the years um, that I've been doing this, the one area that has been, that has been, opening has opened some of the most closed, I would say the closest what to call almost what you would call a brick walls have been university special collections libraries. And the reason for that is that uh, these libraries, some of which are extremely well funded, are in the nature of black holes. In other words, they suck in information, but they don't necessarily put out any much information. So when you're getting into a special collections library, from a university or college or university or whatever, then you're going to find that they have collected original historical manuscripts primarily uh, from the areas that the librarians happen to be interested in and that the professorate at the universities have focused on in writing their histories. So you can expect that a, a special collections library in uh, Utah or Arizona or Texas or Massachusetts or North or South Carolina or wherever would focus on records from that state, not necessarily. It's whatever the professor was interested in, that those original documents and manuscripts and things have been collected. In addition, sometimes people have given their personal collections of records to special collections libraries but that's based upon the fact that they went to that life, went to that college or university. They may have been from someplace completely different in the world, and they gave their papers to that library. Uh, one of the ones that I'm, because I'm a photographer, one of those the, the collections that I'm aware of is a famous uh, American photographer Ansel Adams. Uh, where would you guess his photograph, his whole collection of photographs is? Well, he took pictures all over the Western United States and other places. His collections are in the University of Arizona in Tucson. So this is this is when I talk about being kind of basic research, meaning you don't even have an idea where they might be. And all you can do is say, if somebody was famous and was made in collections or photographs or whatever, or not even if even if they were totally inconsequentially not even famous, but they had something that was interesting, then that may end up in a university special collections library, or a society, or an archive. I think a really good example here, and it's probably the last one we're going to get to today, but a really good example is uh, going into the Hancock County Historical Society in, in Illinois, in Carthage. Illinois, and finding a card catalog, paper catalog with three by five cards of every person who had purchased land in Hancock County ever since the establishment of the county, not digitized, simply there on paper in the library. And so this is the kind of thing that you're likely to find. The other good example is the university, is the Maryland State Archives, where my wife and I spent a year digitizing records for Family Search. Their card catalog, which has hundreds of thousands of documents cataloged, it's gigantic paper catalog. It's not completely digitized, or may not was not at the time, but in a few years. But I would be surprised if much more of it's been digitized. Although I do know that significant an amount of collections of records have just come out of Maryland into the millions of documents, and that was. Uh, some things that were just digitized by Reclaim the Records. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Any additional questions? If you can't find land records for your ancestors, were there other ways in which they rented lands? If so, 
where might those records be? Any land interest in land has to be recorded in order to be valid. So with land records going back into the Middle Ages in Europe or wherever you want to go back in, land records are going to have a, a specific repository, meaning a place where they're kept. In the United States, it's primarily in the counties. So each county has their own records. And it wouldn't matter if they, if they, but if they were renting the land in the sense you're asking perhaps if they were the renters, meaning the person who is the, uh, the, the tenant on the property. Tenant records, not necessarily because they're an interest only in, uh, in time, uh, generally are harder to find because they're not necessarily affect the ownership or the title to the property. They just affect uh, the income or whatever's coming from the property. But those things are usually listed when you have those are intent. Uh, you'll find those in uh, probate records and you'll also find them in tax records. So there's lots of ways out there besides just those that you can find them.